dear learners today we are going to talk about the basics of petroleum this lecture will be in two parts in the first part i am going to talk about the basics of petroleum how petroleum originates and how we uh, study uh, the different elements of petroleum in the second part i am going to talk about the petroleum provinces in the world and in india how they are distributed geographically so let's start with our uh, agenda today so in the first part we are going to talk about what is petroleum how petroleum is originated and then what are the elements that are related to petroleum like the source rock the reservoir rock and the hydrocarbon tap and finally we are going to talk about hydrocarbon migration so petroleum as you know is a naturally occurring substance what does that mean that means that petroleum is generated naturally and it is not manufactured by human being that means it is not replenishable where do we find petroleum normally petroleum is found within the earth crust within the small pores of rocks so we find it in the subsurface petroleum can be found either in a liquid form or sometimes in even a gel like form and petroleum is originated from organic matter so from organic matter to generate the petroleum that we explore for takes millions of years it's a very slow process petroleum also is known as fossil fuel because it generates from the organic matter or we often call it hydrocarbon also why hydrocarbon because petroleum is made up of hydrogen and carbon atoms the basic formula of petroleum as you can see is ch4 as you know it is called methane and it is found in gas form now ch4 is the basic formula but often times the oil that we find underground can have different kind of hydrocarbons in it some are short chain that is the carbon number varies from c20 to c30 some may be very long chain where the carbon number varies from c40 to c70 depending upon what kind of carbon chain that you have the petroleum physical form is derived so if you have only short chain carbons then you find the petroleum in a liquid form it contains all the high end carbons that is the long chain carbons then it becomes jelly like so let's now talk about why we should learn about petroleum as i am going to show you in this slide petroleum is used in our day to day life in various format it's a very busy slide there are lot of information here but if you see that red box there and the blue box down there the red box is the oil and the blue box indicates the gas now that is the basic form that we find petroleum in subsurface but as you can see from that basic oil and gas there are lot of primary and secondary material that is produced by the industries and then those secondary Uh, materials are used by different industries and ultimately we use the end products in the form of textile or food supply or transportation or housing even in our medicines some form of other petroleum products are used so it is absolutely necessary in our day to day life and that is why we need to learn about petroleum more okay let's now talk about the origin of petroleum how petroleum is formed there are four steps through which the organic matter that is found in the nature that transformed into petroleum the first process is deposition what is deposition we need a large quantity of organic matter to be deposited in a 
relatively confined area. That part is called deposition. Once the organic matter is deposited, the next very important step is burial and it has to be very rapid because if you keep the organic matter exposed to the environment to the oxygen, then what will happen? It will get oxygenated or it will simply rot. It will not be preserved to produce a hydrocarbon or petroleum at a later stage. So, we need deposition followed by rapid burial. The fourth stage is diagenesis, where the organic matter changes into something a wax like substance called kerogen, which is a premature crude oil. Diagenesis is followed by a process called catagenesis or cracking. What happens here? In this process, the kerogen gets converted into actual hydrocarbon that is oil or gas. So, these are the very important steps which transforms the organic matter that gets deposited in either a swampy condition or in deep lakes or in ocean bottoms that ultimately gets converted into oil or gas. There is another step which is migration which I am going to talk about in later slides which is actually release of that hydrocarbon and transportation of that hydrocarbon into a reservoir rock. Now, let us understand these things, these steps in a bit more detail. So, what is deposition and burial? I told you that the organic matter needs to be deposited in a large quantity in a confined area and then it needs to be buried rapidly. So, this deposition and burial is actually an interplay of three steps. First, you need to have the organic matter deposited, made and deposited which is we call the biological productivity followed by the preservation. I told you that the organic matter has to be preserved so that it can generate hydrocarbon at a later stage. So, the organic matter need to be deposited in an aerobic condition. It cannot be exposed to oxygen for a long time. The third important thing is not having dilution. What is dilution? That is when the organic matter is deposited, if you have lot of other terrigenous sediments coming and getting deposited in that same area, then the organic matter gets diluted. So, it is no more rich enough to generate volumes of hydrocarbon. So, deposition and burial are actually interplay of these three activities which ultimately preserves the organic matter so that in a later time and in the right condition it can generate hydrocarbon that is oil or gas. Now, let us talk about the hydrocarbon generation process in terms of how the kerogen is formed and what happens after that. So, formation of kerogen from the biomass happens very shallow depth where the temperature is typically less than 50 degree Celsius. So, here those organic matters which got buried, they get transformed into a wax like substance which is called the kerogen. Now, as the sediment gets buried deeper and deeper, the next steps come in which is called the catagenesis. That typically happens between 50 degree Celsius to 150 degree Celsius. This is the last stage where the organic matter now start generating oil. If the temperature increases further, it goes into a gas window where it starts generating gas. Beyond 150 degree Celsius, the kerogen now goes into a metagenesis stage where it produces dry gas. If you increase the temperature even further by burying it even deeper in the earth crust, then it goes into a metamorphic stage which basically changes the rock itself. So, for our purpose we need to understand the diagenesis and catagenesis process which typically takes place right from the subsurface to about a depth where the temperature reaches about 150 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, when you go for 
exploring petroleum, what are the things that you look for? How do you know there could be a petroleum presence subsurface or not? You basically look for three things. Number one is the source or the kitchen as we call it. This is the area where petroleum is generated under suitable condition. The second important thing is that once the petroleum is generated, it needs to be stored in a rock from where it can be exploited later. That rock is called the reservoir rock. So, you have source and then now you need a reservoir rock to store that petroleum or oil and gas. The third thing, if you do not cap that rock which is porous, then petroleum will leak out and exposed to the surface elements. So, you need to have something by which you trap the petroleum in that reservoir rock so that it can be exploited later. These three things source, reservoir and trap together is known as the petroleum system elements. So, if you can find these three things in an area, then there is a chance to have petroleum there also. Okay, let us talk about source, reservoir and trap in a bit more detail now. Source rock is typically a sedimentary rock that has high organic content and that can generate hydrocarbon if exposed to suitable temperature and pressure conditions. Now, if I give you a rock, how do you know whether it is a good source rock or bad source rock? What is the potential of that source rock? So, you need to measure three things in that source rock. Number one is the organic richness, number two is the kerogen type and number three is the thermal maturity that that source rock has attained. How do we measure that? A very important analysis that we need to do to measure these things within the source rock is called rock evil pyrolysis. There is a second matrix also that is vitrinite reflectance which I am also going to talk about. Now, before we understand the three elements of source rock maturity, let us talk about the rock evil pyrolysis which is very important for measuring the quality of the source rock. Rock evil pyrolysis is nothing but a controlled temperature heating method in an inert atmosphere. You cannot expose the kerogen to oxygenated environment. So, we basically heat it in a chamber which is having helium instead of oxygen. So, that we can simulate the condition of source rock maturation. Let us learn about the rock evil pyrolysis process first before we get into analyzing the data. So, we typically take a source rock sample. How do we get a source rock sample? We might take it from the surface if there is a source rock outcrop or we can drill a well and take a core of the source rock which is basically a subsurface sample of the rock and then take small samples from that core, small means about 100 milligram, crush it and then put it in the oven. The first step, we keep the oven at 300 degrees Celsius for about 3 minutes. What happens in that uh, 3 minutes? In that temperature, if the rock already have existing hydrocarbon which has generated from that rock, that gets evaporated and we measure that using a flame ionization detector. That gives us the first peak that you see on the left hand diagram, the S1 peak. In the second step, we increase the temperature of the oven in a controlled manner that is 25 degrees Celsius per minute and we take it up to 550 degrees Celsius. So, 300 degree to 550 degrees, it is about 10 minutes. Each minute we increase the temperature by 25 degrees Celsius. What happens to the rock now? Now, whatever carbon is there, hydrocarbon compounds are there, they start getting cracked. The kerogen starts generating oil and we measure again a S2 peak through flame ionization detector. Now, the temperature at which S2 reaches its peak is also important. We measure that temperature also and we call it the T max temperature and I am going to explain how we use this data. 
Now, we also measure uh, CO2 that generated that gets generated in this process between 300 and 390 degrees Celsius and we measure how much CO2 is generated from the source rock. We also measure that CO2 as the S3 peak and I am going to talk about how we use this S3 data in my later slides. Now, let us understand how we use the data, how the data gives us or helps us to characterize the source rock. Now, let us focus on this picture in the middle. What you see here are 5 samples which are taken from different depths. The top sample taken from about 800 meters and the deepest sample taken from about 2700 meters. You see 2 peaks here. The red peak on the left hand side denotes the S1 peak and the pink peak on the right hand side denotes the S2 peak. Now, if you look at the shallowest sample at 800 meter, what you see is a very tiny S1 peak, but a very large S2 peak. What is S1? S1 tells us how much hydrocarbon has already been generated by that source rock. S2 on the other hand talks about what is the potential of the source rock. If you expose it to the right kind of temperature, how much hydrocarbon it can generate. So, the first sample has a very tiny amount of hydrocarbon that is already generated, but there is a large potential which it can generate if it gets exposed to the right temperature. As you go deeper in that same well, you see the S1 peak increasing and S2 peak decreasing. That means that as we increase the depth and the temperature also increases with depth, we have more and more hydrocarbon generated and less and less hydrocarbon left within the source rock that can be generated. And as you go to the bottom most, you see maximum hydrocarbon by this stage has already been generated, only a tiny little hydrocarbon that can be generated from that source rock. Now, let us focus on how the S2 peak behaves here. If you see at the 800 meter sample, what I talked about the temperature at which S2 peaks it called the T max. Now, if you look at that line, the black line, that is the T max temperature for the S2 peak at 800 meter depth. As we go down depth, we see that the T max or the S2 peak is shifting towards right. right? That means that the source rock is most immature because the T max is at a lower temperature at 800 meter, but as you go deeper, the source rock is getting more and more mature, and that is why the temperature or the T max is shifting towards right or the higher temperature. Now, we will stop here. And we are going to talk about the thermal maturity and the kerogen types in the next part of the video that we are going to talk about. Thank you.